fascinating interviews and compelling conversations. Be present, The Diane Ray Show. Welcome to the show today. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation that I'm very excited to just dive right into because I think it's so needed and such important information. Chances are that you or someone you're close to is dealing with mental health or addiction issues. And as a matter of fact, I bet it's 100% of the population that at least knows someone dealing with these issues, even if they're not directly affected. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, nearly one in five U.S. adults live with a mental illness. One in five. I mean, that's just such a huge percentage of people. And I'm going to throw myself you know, out there on the fire. I mean, I'm personally affected by this as I have a family member who's dealing with major depression and drug dependency right now. As we speak, you know, I've been getting phone calls today. I'm trying to get him into the treatment that he needs. And and it's a horrible feeling to get those calls in the middle of the day from someone crying in need, you know, telling you they don't want to live. You're totally derailed. What do you do? So thankfully, my guest is here today and we're going to talk about this because she knows this feeling of helplessness all too well. Pamela Brinker has an amazing book called Conscious Bravery, and she shares some of her personal story of dealing with her two sons with addiction issues and how she's been working through this, getting through this. This book is for the person who is getting these phone calls and dealing with a spouse, a child, a parent, a friend who's trying to navigate the world of mental health and addiction. And this book really is a lifeline. It will help you prioritize your own self-care so that you aren't dragged down into the abyss. And each chapter is a key to unlock a door to help you access the strength you need to survive and thrive. It's really important information. And I'm so happy to welcome Pamela to the show. So thank you for joining my humble podcast. Oh, thank you so (laughs) much, Diane. It's a delight to be here. This is so important to talk about. And, you know, I'm going to selfishly use this conversation for my own needs. As I mentioned, you know, in in the beginning, I mean, I'm dealing with this personally, myself, just like a a lot of other people in this world. And and I love the title, Conscious Bravery, because you really have to be brave to, to continue moving forward with this. And what does that mean to you, Conscious Bravery? It's having the awareness to see whatever's needed in any given moment, the array of options, and then doing something, taking action, even if that action means being patient. Sometimes conscious bravery within the conscious piece is about the awareness that we must have and that I haven't had, you know, I didn't have 12 years ago, but slowly, slowly I developed because I was so committed to it and practiced it so often. So consciousness is really not this esoteric overarching umbrella necessarily. It's more being able to be present in any given moment and awake and aware, even if we're feeling devastated, shocked, overwhelmed, as you mentioned the word helpless, and then being able to see that we can calm down our nervous systems. The autonomic nervous system wants us to, you know, fight or flee, curl up in a ball and feign death or fawn, right? Please someone. And so we have to reset our nervous systems by pausing, at least I've had to, and and most of my clients (laughs) have found success in this. When we can pause, reset our nervous systems, then we can see an array of options that, offer some sort of a solution in the moment. It may not be the end solution we want or the end goal, but it's a step toward it. And so that's the bravery piece because bravery is is nothing if it's not action. We can't just intend bravery and walk around going with affirmations. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to be brave because certainly the universe will give us that test and, and put something in front of us that makes us take action. And again, as I said, and I like to say conscious bravery isn't always tough as nails. Bravery can look like softness and it can sound like stillness. 
So we want to be able to have this capacity that's within all of us to be able to instinctually rise up and do whatever's needed in any given moment and not just do what we're prone to doing. You know, I've known that all too well. I, I was an athlete a lot of my life, a competitive athlete. So I, I was prone to jumping in and trying to kind of save the day. But I've learned over time that sometimes I need to wait five minutes, five hours, five days until my my loved one has made some choices in their best interest and has started to use some of their agency. And then I can partner with them in doing what's best. So bravery can look a hundred ways on a hundred different days. <laughs> that I, I love what you're saying on, on so many, so many different levels. It's, it's resonating with me, especially of bringing your attention to the present moment. And that's something I've been struggling with even so much to where I named this podcast, Be Present, because I'm always trying to remind myself to do that. And one of um, my great teachers, influencers um, that I worked with, Louise Hay, she would always say, the point of power is in the present moment. And it really is because you can only control that, that moment to make a choice to to do A or B, you know, that that's really the only thing that you have any control over. And, and also what you were describing is like the, um, my business partner says this to me all the time. I'm, I'm the one that's like fire, aim, ready, you know, instead of ready, <laughs> aim, fire. And I, you know, here I am to save the day and, I'm, you know, I'm going to help you call me. And, and I've had to really struggle with that myself, you know, to, you know, not always leap up and, and make a, make a choice or a decision because sometimes it's not going to be the right thing. And that's happened many times. Um, but I think a lot of us are probably nodding our, our heads listening to this, you know, yeah, I, I do that too. You know, we have to think about that, that moment that we're in, that we can be brave and we can do hard things even if we're normally passive, right? I mean, even if bravery is not a, a comfortable thing for us. Absolutely. And as you're saying, we can cultivate skills, even though things don't come naturally to us and we have a predisposition to operate one way or another. For example, a lot of my clients and friends have told me that they've started realizing that the skills they have in the work arena can be transferred to the home arena or the skills they have as a pianist can be, you know, the skills of practicing, practicing, and then performing in front of someone else. Those those skills can be applied to how we walk alongside our loved one who struggles with mental health issues and substance use. And so we, we have all this capacity within us. And like so many people talk about that you've interviewed on your shows, um, there is no life without peace. Michael Pascal said that, and probably a lot of other people have. And so I find that one of the most crucial steps, you, you talked about all the all the chapters of my book being, in essence, keys to bravery, and they are, and we can go into that. But one of the most crucial steps is to breathe consciously, to I like bring that. steadiness to the moment. And that's how we enter into presence. You know, people say, okay, well, I know I should be present, but how do I do it? <laughs> right. And so I say, you have the capacity within, within you every single waking breath you're alive because the breath is the doorway. You know, if our breath is steady, our choices are more steady. We can calm our minds, calm our emotions via the breath. And you devoted a whole chapter to this. And I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because this is an important tool for people to have. And I think a lot of people don't realize how they're breathing in, in a moment. I, I mean, if you, when you get bad news, it's, you know, you, you hold your breath. You're, you're not breathing at all. Right. So it's very, it's very important to learn how to do that. And, and you describe it so beautifully. Um, I mean, can you give us like maybe just a little, mm. <sighs> we can just take a breath now <laughs> as, as I'm sure. thinking about my, my Thank aggravation you. I'll be dealing with later, you know, I'm going to need to, to breathe through that. Uh, but I think it's something that we don't think about. Absolutely. We don't. And you're so right. So we begin with awareness, Diane, and all of our listeners. We begin noticing how do we tend to breathe in the calm moments. And then along a continuum, at least I've noticed in myself, how do I breathe when I get disrupted? How do I breathe when I'm agitated or frustrated or angry? And it tends to change. So you talked about we might freeze and we might not breathe at all. That might be during shock 
right? But during a moment of panic, we might be breathing really fast. And so the beautiful thing about the breath is it can either calm us down or help us rise up. And people like Wim Hof have taught us this, you know, thank goodness for people around the planet that are teaching us so many different ways of connecting with our bodies and our breath. But at any rate, let's do it right now, like you were saying. So, so we begin by remembering that breathing is always available to us. And I have to remember that all the time because just like you today, I got some phone calls that I did not expect and some texts, <laughs> one of them involving the police. <laughs> so I noticed my breathing first off. I wouldn't have done this eight years ago, but now I notice, wow, my breath is activated. I'm breathing more quickly. Okay, I'm going to stand and I, I tend to not just breathe more consciously, but I tend to stand and get barefoot on the bare ground because that's that's one of the best ways to connect with with what's underneath us to support us right right and so breathing gives us that flexibility to maybe stand or sit we can breathe in slowly with conscious awareness not just into our lungs but into our whole being and then exhale and notice the the release of some of the tension going out and a lot of people like to say well just take three deep breaths Three deep breaths is not sufficient to calm the sympathetic nervous system that's activated. It has to be conscious. So we breathe in with awareness, noticing, hey, what's going on in my mind, my heart, my body, the energy space around me. And then we notice that point where we're switching to breathing out. And the exhale is important to, to really elongate that exhale especially for anxiety or panic. So we're breathing out slowly. So let's let's do that for just two more breaths. Sure, on the I'll show. breathe right now. Because I yeah, looked over we'll at just... my phone and there was the aggravation <laughs> calling me as I'm oh. as I'm doing an interview, talking to the perfect person at this moment, mm. <laughs> at this very present moment. So I'm going to do this breath so we can continue mm. to have our conversation. And I, I won't be triggered by my phone calling, or someone calling me right at this moment. So let's breathe. Well, thank you for that example. So let's notice, <laughs> let's notice that you example. were looking at your phone. And if you can, listeners or Diane, let's let's put our phones away for just a moment. So we can't see over, the screen. So can't see it. Yeah. If it lights up, then it's gonna light up whether we look at it or not. So let's not look. And and we'll look within, closing our eyes. We're breathing into our beautiful beings, our bodies, hearts, minds, soul, intuition, essence, and energy space. Breathing in and then release. Just let it out. Breathing in. We're noticing the in-breath right here, right now. And breathing out, we're releasing what's not necessary, what we don't need this moment. And thankfully, we're here in this moment with the breath. So what did you notice just better. now doing that? Thank you. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. And those little, little nuanced improvements are so important because we tend to think black and white, right? I do. I tend yeah. to think, oh, am I, am I good or am I not so good? But really I, I operate on a continuum. I'm okay, or I'm agitated or frustrated, or I'm maybe you know, frustrated moving into anger or I'm angry or hurt or upset or um, traumatized even. And so I want to notice where I am on the continuum so that I know my breath is here. And I love to not just breathe, but as you can tell, um, you can see me, I'm giving myself a hug. The listeners may not know, but I'm putting one hand across my body to my opposite shoulder and same with my other hand opposite to my other shoulder. And I'm feeling my body and I'm giving myself a hug. And why do I do this? because that is regulation. It's a big word for just making myself feel better. <laughs> but <Right. laughs> self-regulation is what my book's all about, what, what we have to do when we want to walk alongside someone who struggles more than we do and be successful, be their role model. We self-regulate. How else can they regulate and find peace and make the decisions they need to make, find greater peace? So right. we can co-regulate like you and I are looking at each other and even though we're across a bunch of wavelengths and states <laughs> we are right here with one another this moment is precious because there's this beautiful connection 
between us. And I can feel it. It's quite and, emotional. And doing and doing that just does, you know, as I'm, I'm hugging myself now, mm-hmm. you know, brings you just to, okay, to this second, okay, I'm going to take that breath. Mm-hmm. And I like to do, uh, if anyone's familiar with yoga, the Ujjayi breath, where, or, or the Darth Vader breath, like you describe in the book, and you feel it in the back of your throat. And just be able to, to calm yourself. It's it's an important tool that that anybody can do, to kind of it bring is. yourself in. And then when you're in a better state like that, you'll be able to make a better decision, a better choice on your next step of whatever you have to do, instead of fire aim ready, which <laughs> I've done a lot in the past. But I'm getting better. You know, awareness I think is is an important piece too. Being aware of you know, these other steps that you can take and then not getting sucked in to the drama. I mean, and and you dealing with not only one son, but two. I mean, you, you were dealing with two of your children that have had these kind of challenges. So that's a lot of a lot of breathing, right? It's a lot of you know <laughs> it's a lot of breathing. Yeah. And you're right, and I'm not alone. Um, many of our listeners have two or maybe three people, maybe a parent that struggles with something in terms of mental health. I've had I went into my profession as a psychotherapist and workshop leader, having had two cousins who were very brilliant, who took their own lives because of depression. And so I think unconsciously in my early 20s, I became a therapist, kind of thinking, all right, well, if I can get a handle on this, then I can prevent it in my family, my my, my children, if I have children someday. But you know, there are a lot of things that are out of our control. And so both of my sons have had mental health challenges that one has ADD and the other has ADHD with the hyperactivity. So attention deficit, they call it a disorder. I call it a gift almost really. And the other one has the uh, hyperactivity with it. And then they both have anxiety and all kinds of other things that they've struggled with. In addition to having um, chosen um, to manage the pain and grief they experienced when my their stepdad died 11 years ago. They chose to turn to each other, but that also involved turning to drugs and alcohol as an answer to their pain. And I use that word chose right here because they chose to turn to one another and they didn't know at that age, 13 and 16, how to just kind of hang out together and support each other through grief. It back, you know, a lot for a lot of young people, it involves let's use a substance. Let's make ourselves feel better. But nobody wants to choose to become addicted or substance dependent. Nobody chooses to, ha- to have mental health challenges. Nobody's going, yeah, yeah, universe, that's what I want to become more joyful. Just give it to me. Bring it on. You know, <laughs> nobody's the, who wants that. And so we I, I found that we need tremendous compassion for ourselves and our beloveds as we do these practices like breathe consciously. There's a huge compassion component to it. And there's a huge compassion component when we're listening, truly listening to those we love and care about. We bring compassion and big wide ears to what they're saying. There was an interesting part of the book where, and and where you you mentioned compassion, and I think that's really key, compassion for yourself. And, And a part of that is really, before we can help someone else, we really have to know who we are. And I think that's a big one because when you get sucked into someone else's stuff, you know, their drama, what's going on, you want to help all of this, it's very easy to get lost and lose sight of who you are. Who are you in all this, you know, tempest? And when you work with people, I mean, and you ask them, you know, who are you or how do you feel? Are they like surprised? I don't know who I am. A lot of people answer, I'm not sure who I am, because crises tend to do that to us. They crisis, crisis shakes us up. And if we knew who we were before, all of a sudden we're faced with, I'm different now. I don't know what to do in this situation. And so when I ask clients or p- participants in my workshops, who are you? I ask them to pause and not define themselves according to a job, a role, a situation. And so for you and our listeners, I would ask, let's let's look at who am I without without saying I'm a mom, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, I'm a guitar player, I'm a poet, 
uh, I love nature, I'm a hiker, I'm a runner, whatever, without saying I'm spiritual. None of those things, those are things that we do, that we might be good at, that we might be gifted at or devoted to, but who we truly are is inside of us. It's our essence. I like the elegant word essence because it's not laden with dogma or associations like soul can be or self. And so to me, I offer that who we are is this beautiful essence that is connected to the quantum, to God, to source, whatever you want to call it. And so who we are is never changing. And it only takes a second, a millisecond to go inside and connect right here and say, oh, there I am. This is who I am. I'm not my situation. My circumstances don't define me. I'll get through this. I'm right here. I'm partnering with me. This is, this is, this is how I'll know what to do is by connecting with my inner self. And the, the beautiful thing about our essence is it is the source of our love, our success, our bravery, our ability to be conscious. All the things we want are right inside here in our essence, because I'm not saying that we're so great and wonderful, although we are, we're miraculous beings, but we're never alone, Diane. It's so amazing. We're connected. I'm interwoven with you and I'm interwoven with every listener and with every sentient being on this planet and with the source of my meditation and my love, God, the universe, this infinite space. And so I'm never alone. And that is crucial to know, I have found over time, because so many times I feel absolutely alone. Like no one called. This is so synchronicitous that you and I have both gotten phone calls and texts today from oh, yeah. our loved ones right before our show, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, how many friends can we tell that to? Probably a lot, but a lot of people keep it a secret. So that's another piece I write about in my book, Conscious Bravery, is that we've got to ask for help because giving and receiving help is sacred. We are not alone. And other people want to be there for us, you know, with some boundaries, certainly, and not just, you know, at all times, day and night, but, but, and then we can receive that help. And it can be this sacred exchange. Yes, that's true. And I love what you're saying about essence. And in, in the book, you say what the other thing that we are not is we are not our thoughts. Thoughts are just ways to kind of categorize things or, you know, and, and I, I really like that description because so often we get caught in that hamster wheel of thoughts. And, and you're right. That is not who we are at our essence, at our core. It's not. And those of us who meditate and maybe know this, those of us who who meditate sometimes forget though, because our thoughts are so big and booming and ever present, you know, but, but our mind is such a wonderful thing. I don't really disregard or disrespect the mind. I, I think we want to honor it just as we do our hearts and our bodies, but we do want to not, we want to not define ourselves by our thoughts. So we've got to get out of that thinking mind into our beingness, into our bodies. And we can do that by, tapping into the essence. We can do that by that whole being scan that I describe in my book too. Yes. That's such a great tool. And in the book, Thanks. you describe whole being awareness as something that's beyond mindfulness. And I wanted you to just elaborate a little bit on that. Cause I think a lot of people are familiar with the term mindfulness. You know, it's become a buzzword. We, we heard it a lot, especially over the past few years, but it, it's bigger than that, and and I want to and I want to learn myself because I'm I'm a warrior, I'm always in the in the past or the future, and not in this moment. And I really want to be more aware and in control of that, and have that whole body awareness. Mm. You have my whole heart because I'm a warrior too. A lot of us are anxious. It's almost like our society encourages that, and we we do, uh, I guess, embed somehow into our upbringing that if we stay connected to our past or we think about the future that we'll be better off you know but but that's not really true we're better off living in the present moment but how do we get there how do we get right here right now and so we breathe in through this whole being scan so let's let's do that in a minute but let's go back to mindfulness as you were talking about mindfulness is a catchphrase it's a great concept and tool 
that we can use to just be right here my, right now. But what we really mean by mindfulness isn't to be in our full minds. <laughs> That's what the word conjures for me, mindfulness. My mind is already too, too full. <laughs> I don't want that. I want to kind of be less full, have less thoughts that I'm trying to sort. And I want to be right here right now with a capacity to make a better choice. So I say, let's get out of our minds and let's use the word whole being awareness and use a tool that I've come up with and teach to get into our whole beings. So whole being awareness is to be aware of all six zones of our experience in any moment. And that might sound like a lot to a lot of people. Six zones? What are you doing? Are you kidding me? How can I be aware of six things? It's enough for me just to be mindful and be kind of more aware than I was before. But if we think about it, whenever we ride a bike or swim or connect with a friend or have great sex, we are aware on every level of our experience. And so the six zones of our experience are our minds, our hearts, our bodies, our intuition, the energy space surrounding us, because our bodies don't end with our skin, and our essence. So again, mind, heart, body, intuition, energy space, and essence. And so whenever we tap in with what we might have formerly called mindfulness, when we ever, whenever we tap into what's going on, what we're experiencing, what's happening around us, what we really want to do is say, what am I experiencing in all six of these zones. So I encourage people to use one to three words for any of the six zones. So I'll do it really fast with us. If I tap, I like to go into my heart first. So if I, if I tap into my heart right now, I might feel heavy, but I might at the same time feel hopeful. So I'm using two words because I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do that because we might feel two seemingly opposing things at the same time. So in my heart, I'm feeling those two things. If I go to my mind, I might be feeling, let's, I'll, I'll continue on with two things. I might be feeling both agitated and yet focused. Those two things are possible as well. So we just note these without judging, without a story, without saying, oh gosh, but this is going to happen. We just stop it there and go, okay, wait a minute. I'm just, just back to noticing what's going on in my experience. Okay. So in our bodies, my throat might fe be feeling tight, but my body might be feeling active, like I'm ready to move. So that's what's happening for me right now. I don't know about for our listeners. So listeners, you can continue on with me if you will. Let's tap into our intuition. Our intuition is what is saying something to us. It's picking up on a lot of data from a lot of sources. So right now my intuition is saying, stick with this and focus. But I'm cautious to tell everyone, we don't always want to just listen to our intuition, like a lot of people say, because the intuition is not the end all source of knowledge either. <laughs> it's really our whole being. <laughs> right. So we go from our intuition, then into the energy space around me. Well, in my space, it's vibing with protection and safety because I'm here in my home office. But for some of you, you might be in your car. You might have pulled off to the side of the road listening to this, and you might be feeling very agitated and trying to calm down. So just notice that. Just be aware. And now, lastly, let's go into our essence. For me, my essence is almost always feeling solid and connected. At least that's my awareness of it now. And so, so then I just notice all of that data and I did that. I took longer, you know, by explaining it, but I can do that. Most of us can do it in 30 seconds if we just really right. quickly tune in. Just like I said, when we're riding a bike, we're not thinking about what's going on in my energy space. What's my heart telling me? We're just aware of all of it at once. And we make, we maneuver around things and we make decisions as we go or same with swimming. You know, we're looking around, we're taking breaths. So that whole being scan is absolutely crucial to developing conscious bravery, because how can we know what to do if we don't know what we're experiencing, if we're always defining ourselves based upon what's happening around us with other people or in the world? I like that exercise and how you explain it, because you're doing it without judgment. We're, we're not judging what those feelings are. It, it just is. This is what I'm feeling now. and you know, when you're able to identify those things and then you can make whatever choice or decision from a better place after, after recognizing that. And it might be a difficult decision, like you describe in the book, uh, where you might have to lie or 
do something that is uncomfortable, but, but you can get to that decision and feel that it's the right one and feel good about it. So true. And, and I'm glad you're bringing that up because I don't often lie and I have a commitment to not lie, but um, you're bringing that up because in the book, I tell a story about having to lie to my 16 year old son who had run away from home. And we felt as family members and parents that he, he was at risk, you know, for, for being a runaway for a longer period of time for being a long-term runaway and trying to live on the street and that sort of thing. So um, when he said, I'll come back home as long as I don't have to go to wilderness therapy, I said, okay, knowing full well that I, I knew he needed to go to wilderness therapy because it was the safest, most highly respected, prescribed place for teenage boys to, to get a handle on things without screens, with, with, to reconfigure the family, you know, cause we wanted him to go not just for his sake, but also for our whole family to have the chance to, to work on ourselves. We had a really systemic problem that had emerged and, and had shown itself by our son's uh, anxiety and substance use issues and getting expelled from high school and having extreme, extreme substance use to the point of, you know, us worrying about death or life. And so it was kind of a death or life situation, I felt, in terms of lying that one time. And sometimes right. we might have to do that. But in general... <laughs> yeah, not that we're advocating, I, you know, <laughs> lying yeah, on a regular general, basis. In general, conscious bravery means I might withhold information. If, like today, I was asked... Um, do you know, have you ever met this person's mother or father? And I was put on the spot by, um, by someone. Well, I guess I could say it was a police officer. And I said, you know, I don't recall. And then I just changed the subject. I don't know her last name because I didn't want to get her in trouble. And I didn't want to get myself stuck in a lie that I didn't want to tell. But I had been prompted because of another person's involvement in this whole situation. So sometimes situations are sticky like that. But breathing and being whole, being aware helps us to know, what will I do? How can I live with myself after, after I say something here? <laughs> yes. No, it's messy. It does get messy. And you have to do, you know, that, that was the right choice in that moment, you know. And you also talk about that you know, in the book, dealing with what is and not wish for a different situation, but accepting, okay, this, you know, this is what's happening right now. And, you know, not putting your head in the sand, which would probably be a lot I more comfortable. I love your questions. Yes. <laughs> and yes, we don't want to put our heads in the sand, but we also don't want to be up in the clouds so much that we're hovering above our lives. At least I have done that and it has not gone well for me, <laughs> you know, just kind of being a hovercraft up here, kind of wanting to escape things. That doesn't really have a great end result. So yes, I want to be in the present moment and how it's one of the pillars of conscious bravery. I live with a now there's this approach. So I often say that to myself. When something has arrived in my world, I say, huh, now there's this. And I try to say it neutrally. I try to calm my nervous system. And I try, instead of going, oh my gosh, I can't do this. Or, oh wow, how will this play, play out? Or what if A, B, C, D, E? Or like you said, jump in first. And like, okay, I'm hopping in my car. I'm going. And I pause and I say, okay, wait a minute. Now there's this. And the now piece brings me into the present moment. I do conscious breathing. I might do a quick whole being scan. And the there's this is, is a way to define what's happening without, again, judging it. I don't say this is horrendous or this is horrible or, oh my gosh, this is impossible. I'll never get out of this. I don't put judgments on it. I just say, there's this. I try to look at the facts. Just the facts. Or at there's least this. The the objective, the, the most objective way I can look at the situation as possible. The subjectivity can come in later, but in the moment when I say now there's this, it's, it's a way to plant myself. And yes, very effective. What is, yeah, and partner and with Ra it. Have you yeah. ever read any Ram Dass? Yes, I love Ram Dass. I'm such Me great too. Fan. I'm a big fan of, oh. of his, and he calls it being the witness. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're witnessing there's this. Okay. Mm -hmm. How, you know, how am I going to, to handle that? But it gives you a second, 
right? To be able to it does. figure things out. Yes. And Ram Dass doc documentary is amazing. And I love, so I love being the witness and that comes from us be going inside to, to the, our essence. We can call it whatever we want. Michael Singer calls it the seer. You know, we really look into our lives, not just from the inside going out or the outside going in, but in this whole energetic space there is this awareness and this ability to see and hear. And that's what now there's this does. And it helps us to witness with, without so much fear. It's tough being a human. Sometimes there is a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. it, it was just so it's mm -hmm. been so timely and, and wonderful for me to read this and, and remember some things that I like being, being the witness, you know, and you're describing it in a different way, but you know, remembering these things that these are tools that are available to me, you know, doing the whole being awareness scan that that is so helpful. And what mm. will my next steps be in dealing with my own situation with someone who's, you know, obviously uh, not thinking clearly dealing with depression, you know, threatening suicide um, to get me to do something, you know, there's some manipulation in that, you know, mm hmm. Uh, do I really think that that's going to happen? No, I think that it's emotional blackmail on someone else's part to threaten me with that, you know, and then to say, oh, when I do this, I'm going to be helping you because I'm, I'm leaving you my money. <laughs> that, was, that was part of it. <laughs> I'm leaving you my money. Oh, so you're going to leave me with this mess to clean up. <laughs> you think this is a, a great boon to me that you're going to do mm -hmm. this because you're leaving me your money. That, mm. <laughs> that was, that was part of it. Um, but I, I had to, I've had to just continually, you know, remind myself, I mean, the, the, everything in the book that you share is so useful. So many people are going to be you. able to relate to this and to use it. And that's what we need is things we can use. Absolutely. These are tools and practices that are all interchangeable and all build upon one another. And so I'm glad you're bringing up situations where we feel manipulated and so forth, because we want to be able to develop skills in befriending all of our feelings, even our shame. And that's one of the chapters, even our disgust or overwhelm. We want to be able to breathe consciously, as we've talked about. We want to, we've got to use the whole being scan and go beyond mindfulness and build our awareness. We, we want to be in the present moment so we can use this now, there's this approach. And another thing that that works along with these part and parcel is to become more comfortable with overwhelm. At least for me, I've had to become more comfortable with discomfort and overwhelm so that I don't just reactively say, Oh gosh, I don't want my, my beloved to end up homeless or to end up injured long-term or with an infection, you know, all these horrible things that have happened, um, my, my sons have been in the most horrendous situations for those of you listeners that pretty much any, anyone on the, on the show who's listening has been in, you know, they've been knifed, they've been involved with drug dealers. Um, and they've made a lot of the choices that led to that, but, but they didn't choose the trauma of being assaulted and strangled, things like that. So I have to become more comfortable knowing that these things happened and they can happen again. I don't want them to. I'm not going to manifest that. I'm not going to fixate and worry. But if I'm not aware that that more difficult things could come, then I'm not prepared, right? It's just like when I was a triathlete, I had to practice swimming in the open water, even though not all the triathlons I were in were in open water. But I had to become really skilled at handling tough waves and other swimmers really close by me and around me and all that kind of stuff. And so that maybe can be a metaphor for us for, for really being able to survive the storms. We have to be familiar with storms. We have to know how to handle being out in the pouring hail when the wind is gushing and trees are falling, which happened a year ago in my community. You know, it was like this tornado happening in Colorado Springs and a tree hit our home, our neighbor's home, trees were completely uprooted. So we want to become familiar with that kind of not just discomfort, but even overwhelm and, and know that we can handle it. Know that we've gotten through tough stuff before. I've gotten through some of the toughest stuff that I've heard about from any of my friends or clients. And I bet our listeners have too. And so I would offer, you have too, my friend. And so knowing everything you've been through, 
you're so much stronger than you maybe know. And so becoming more comfortable with all of your capacity will, will continue to help you. Yes, and then another, I think so. yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now I was, I'm thinking of you doing a, a triathlete in the open water and the fears. You didn't even mention sharks. That would have been my first fear would be, wow, not only the swimmer next to me, but the shark, you know, but, but we can navigate the shark infested waters is, uh, mm-hmm. is the point, I guess. It is, but it's a good metaphor because the shark is something that maybe would be completely unexpected. Race directors choose areas for for open water triathlons where they don't think they're going to be sharks. But what if there are, you know, and so that might happen in our lives too. And I have a lightheartedness about this only because, heck, life is short. Why not? Why not bring a little humor and lightheartedness into the devastation that we've all been through too? You know, I find that play brain helps me and I cannot handle the toughest stuff unless I can kind of be like Russell Brand and, and laugh stuff off. Oh my gosh, I was listening to one of his meditations last night and oh, he's just funny as heck. And um, so if you really want a good laugh, if you're really struggling, maybe go to Russell Brand's meditation on anxiety. It's just... He's for. great. I'll have to, I'll have to look at that. I haven't seen any of his meditations, but I have heard some of his stuff and his podcast yeah. and his comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, humor. I mean, I I'll put on something, um, a, a, com- a comedian on Netflix, you know, something like that. If I, I can't take the news anymore. So let's <laughs> take care of ourselves and make ourselves mm-hmm. laugh. You know, humor mm-hmm. is, is very important, I think, in helping to navigate all of these crazy things. And mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you, how are your sons doing today? Are, are things looking okay? Or there's challenges and there, I would, seem to end. You know, it's so, that's a great question. Thank you so much. I think in general, they're doing really well compared to where they have been. You know, they have been in some of the most devastating situations and they were both addicted to methamphetamines and um, variations of those like cocaine and other substances, uh, Vyvanse, Adderall, all, all those things in the amphetamines category, which are really horrific. Um, one of them almost had a heart attack, which can happen when you're on various forms of meth. You know, your heart can just be racing and you're more prone to, to all kinds of things. But so, so as of, because looking back at all of that, as of today, they're both doing really, really well. However, they're still finding their way, you know, and it's, it's this, this concept that change takes time. And so as a person who loves them as a mom and as a friend as well, and somebody that wants to be present and not enabling and not managerial, I want to walk alongside them and see their successes and convey confidence to them that I believe in them as young men and that they will make some choices that may not be in their best interests in the end, but they'll need to, they'll learn from their mistakes. And so I've learned the hard way to, to kind of zip it up at times and just say, Hmm, and listen, Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. What do you, what, what do you think you'll do about that? Oh, okay. Huh. But my energy has to really believe in that. I have to really, I can't be going, Oh God, don't do that. You know, (laughs) deep inside, or they're going to pick up on that because the people we love are very regulated with us and know what we're, what we're thinking and they can, they can pick up on what we're thinking, feeling or our energy. And so I would say they're both doing much, much better. My, one of my sons is doing maybe the best he's done in his adult life right now. And he has miraculously, you know, really grace has come. And a lot of what we thought were going to be permanent mental health challenges are apparently not. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia at one point. So when I was on a show three months ago, I was saying, Right now, one of my sons is diagnosed with schizophrenia, but it turns out that those symptoms did minimize, and um, that doesn't always happen. I'm, I'm sorry to say, you know, I have another, I have another friend, one of my son's friends, who s- still has what looks like um, symptoms of schizophrenia. But at any rate, um, so that old, the old, one of the older sons is um, doing so well, has a job, you know, and is really committed absolutely doing everything he can quit smoking, quit using drugs. So, I mean, quitting smoking after smoking a pack a day for 12 years, that's pretty tremendously huge in addition to giving up all substances. So, you know, they're doing really well. The, um, the other son is, 
is still finding his way. He's, I believe in harm reduction, and I'll just be bold about saying that, and medical supported, uh, medication supported recovery. I believe in all kinds of things because different things work for different people. Some people on our show listening are going to benefit from 12 step. That's great. 12 step is a wonderful resource for so many people. I've liked the changes program. I've liked the invitation to change approach that uh, Ken Carpenter. talked about. Yes. Ken Carpenter talked about and Jeffrey Foote. I love, love, love. Um, the beyond addiction approach. I love Kevin McCauley, my, my colleague that is now my friend. He um, is the didactic person at the Meadows and he runs kind of is, is a part of teaching 11 of the Meadows um, in terms of their trainings and so forth. And he came up with the pleasure unwoven concept and did a DVD. So I would encourage everyone become educated, find your own answers. There's not a one size fits all, you know, Definitely substance use is along a continuum and different people come into it in different ways and they go out of it. They come out of it in different ways. And that's where the honoring and the power of volition comes. It's so important to let people choose, have some say in the choices they make at least. That's so true. And there has been a lot of, over the past few years I've noticed like with Ken Carpenter's work and other people that everybody's different, everyone's individual, it's going to take, um, you know, different, different directions. But I like that there's choices now. It's not just AA or nothing, or, or 12 steps or nothing. There's, there's other ways to help people out of this maze. You know, it's not that easy. If it was that simple, right? You know, like the problem would have gone right. away or been minimized, it's just getting worse. So I think the more options that you can give people, the better to help them find their way out of the dark. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to and hear for, about your sons. That's good news. Oh, it's, thank it's, you so much. That you quit smoking. I mean, that's the hardest right. thing to quit. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, he was really cute and said, Mom, watch out. I'm going to be grumpy for maybe some weeks or maybe months. <laughs> and so I try not to take things personally. But but back to the the addiction piece too and giving up substances. You know, it takes so much. We don't really know how a person who is altered by substances ends up making the choices that they make. They're not really sequential. To be able to override a clouded perspective, to override all the things that have happened to their bodies, to their minds, you know, and that's where I love Kevin McCauley's work and people like that who've really researched the um, disease disorder part of addiction or substance use, because things become very altered. And it takes a while to, for a person who really wants to get clean or, or, or get free of uh, alcohol or substances to really incur all the benefits. And so things take time. So I hope our listeners and you, my, you know, my heart does really truly go out to all of you. And it goes out to myself because I've got to just have the staying power to go with the flow, you know, as things continue to change. Yeah. Be gentle with yourself, ask for help and miracles mm -hmm. can happen. And it's been so wonderful to spend this time with you and get your wisdom on this. And I hope people pick up this book, Conscious Bravery. I know it's available on Amazon. And is there a website that we can send people to if they want to reach out and have any questions? Thank you for asking. Yes, you can get my book, Conscious Bravery, Caring for Someone with Addiction on my website. And the website is just my name, PamelaBrinker.com. And you can buy it directly there. You can get it on Amazon. It was, it was a bestseller, an Amazon bestseller back in May. So I think they overstocked it. So right now it went from $17.95 to like $4.08 or something. Wow, <laughs> so price right is slashed. <laughs> $4 for the paperback. You can get it as an ebook. And I narrated it on Audible as well. And then you can also see parts of it on my YouTube channel too, Diane. And my YouTube channel is just, you just go to YouTube and it's my name, Pamela Brinker. And I have a bunch of little short videos too to offer there and a lot of resources on the, the YouTube and on my website. There are blogs and resources for people to and use in the book. To, to get help. Yes, in the book for sure. Yeah. And I would really love, this book is, is so inexpensive right now. I hope it helps you. And if you want, you know, buy it for a friend because so many people that we don't even know are struggling. And this book isn't just for those who struggle with um, someone they love who has addiction or mental health challenges. Um, I lost my husband, my, 
my my kid's um, stepfather 11 years ago. And so for some of my friends and colleagues and also clients have bought this book because they're dealing with grief or the grief of a child being a child who has a parent who's struggling with cancer or Alzheimer's or whatever. So all these tools and practices are helpful for any challenge. Any of those things that we're all going to have to deal with being human comes with mm-hmm. all of those things, right? <laughs> all of those challenges. Yes. And thank goodness that there's people like you that are out there leading the way, you know, giving us a light in the darkness. So go to PamelaBrinker.com, mm. B-R-I-N-K-E-R, pick up the book for you or someone you love. And if you like this podcast, which I hope you do, if you're listening, you know, make sure you follow, subscribe. I'm on all of the podcast distribution plates, Apple, Google, Spotify, and check out all of the other fabulous podcasters on the mindbodyspirit.fm podcast network. It's near and dear to my heart. And thank you, Pamela, for talking with me today. You're doing such important work. Oh, I thank you. I am so grateful. And it's really been an honor to speak with you and your listeners.